Well, thank you, Georgette. And, you know, she's always talking about you Anglicans for life all the time, and I've been hearing about you for years. But um, I'm really impressed when I came in this room and, and to see all your faces and to know that um, there's a substantial network behind her uh, leading the way in your denomination advocating for life. Um, I belong to the Wisconsin Synod Lutheran Church, and whenever I tell people I'm a Lutheran, I always tell them, well, we actually believe the Bible and we're pro-life. <laughs> <laughs> and then their, their frown usually goes away at that point, unless they're pro-abortion. But um, you've really got an impressive list of speakers here. I'm honored to be in the, in the line of speakers with everyone else. Uh, that's great, and thank you, Georgette, for including me. We are going to talk about um, death and protecting people from uh, death at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, we have done some research at the Institute and have come to some really appalling conclusions that I want to share with you. Um, the diagnosis of brain death by the medical community is exploding. And they're using this as a tool to harvest organs and end life. And one of the things you need to understand, which we'll go over, is the money that's involved and is probably the motivating factor here. So we've got the first, the first, uh, here we are. Okay. Well, you know, a lot of people uh, say that pain is the reason you want to have euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide, to put people out of pain. Um, I suffer from chronic pain, have been in pain every day for 15 years. And um, I think what we need to do is deal with the pain the best we can and not kill the patient. So when I go to the Netherlands and or uh, Belgium and uh, work with my pro-life friends, I, I let them know that, you know, if something happens while I'm on your soil, don't, don't let them take me. Um, but, you know, the number of patients who indicate pain is the reason for wanting to end their suffering uh, is very low. Um, 91% uh, cite the loss of autonomy, 87% uh, almost, uh, the inability to be involved in activities that made life enjoyable. I'm experiencing that myself. I can relate to that, but it's not a reason to die. God has a plan for our lives, and until he ends it, we are to be, uh, to the best of our ability, workers in the field. 71% cite loss of dignity, and uh, I think there's a lot of cases, no matter whether we're in perfect health or not, where we're, we run up, a case, up against experiences of loss of dignity. So uh, that's just the way life is. Pain was not above in these top five reasons. Now, uh, a little picture of where we're at. Uh, it changes frequently in America as far as uh, where physician-assisted suicide is legal. It's legal in California, Oregon, Washington, Vermont, Hawaii, Colorado, and the District of Columbia. Now, Montana, where I grew up, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that helping terminally ill patients end their lives does not violate state law. So there was really no specific ruling or case. They just kind of co-opted this issue and, and declared it. I have a good a friend who sits on the, uh, the Montana State Supreme Court, and he is really struggling because he's one of the few constitutional justices on that court, and it's very painful to see the state go the way of, uh, of such as this. Now, um, a lot of people said that you have physician-assisted suicide, you have that option to choose when to die. Well, that will decrease the number or percentages of uh, suicide. Well, guess what? No, that, that's not what happened. Uh, they published an, uh, a study in the October issue of Southern Medical Journal, uh, 2015, not too long ago, and they compared the suicide rates in states before and after they passed assisted suicide. And then they compared these stats with states where there was no assisted suicide. 
And surprise, surprise, there was actually a rise in the rate of suicide by over 6%. See, what they're doing is marketing death legally, and that encourages uh, suicide. It doesn't discourage it. There was no reduction in suicide for young or old individuals, and uh, it didn't even uh, provide delays in committing suicide. Now, a lot of the motivation behind the medical community of ending life prematurely is totally motivated by money. It's, uh, it's all about cost containment. And Obamacare has been a big threat to innocent human life uh, because it builds in that cost containment uh, theology, if you will. Now, uh, as I said, uh, the diagnosis of brain death has been used. Uh, it's being used increasingly. We just had a, a board meeting for the Terry Schiavo Life and Hope Network last night. Um, Bobby Schindler, Terry's brother, uh, presents uh, cases that come into their hotline every month. And uh, we're seeing a, a big increase of that. We're seeing a, a large increase of uh, physicians and hospitals de declaring patients brain dead in the face of amazing evidence that they are actually aware and can respond to uh, movement on command. It is just absolutely appalling and alarming to see uh, what is happening right before our eyes. Now, it's interesting too, the definition of brain death now, this is from, um, there we are. This is from the American Academy of Neurology. It's guidelines for brain death determination. I mean, this is kind of the experts of the experts in this field. And I want to read this to you. Uh, the, the bold is, is what I have emphasized. But this was at the top of the page of all the details of, of how they defined brain death. They said many of the details of the clinical neurologic examination to determine brain death cannot be established by evidence-based methods. Doesn't that send a chill up your spine? Especially when you realize that they're using it more and more in society. None of us are safe. The detailed brain death evaluation protocol that follows is intended as a useful tool for cl clinicians. It must be emphasized that this guidance is opinion-based. That is absolutely frightening. Alternative protocols may be equally informative. We need to use their own words when we're educating others about the dangers of this. Now, hospitals, as you might imagine, differ widely on how they use this brain death diagnosis. Uh, there was, again, some research in 2016 in the uh, influential uh, JAMA Neurology publication, and they looked at over 500 hospitals, and they found huge, huge discrepancies and how they determined a pain, a patient is actually uh, pain dead, or brain dead. Again, you have a tool that's being widely used. When, when a patient is declared brain dead, the insurance stops just like that. What insurance company that is all about cost containment, I could rant and rave about insurance companies for days. Um, what incentive do they have to pump money into uh, a body that is, they've been told is brain dead? So when, when they throw around this, this diagnosis, it has fundamental, enormous consequences for the patient and for the family. Now, I want to um, introduce this next video. Um, this is Jenny Hammond's story. She's she went on to be a nurse for good reason. And um, we did a, when 
I did a um, eight seasons of half hour weekly TV program called Facing Life Head On. We picked up three Emmy Awards for pro-life programming, if you can imagine that. Um, our goal is to mainstream the message, and it, it appears that worked. Um, she was part of a two-part series we did on this topic. So uh, I'll hit this button, Sammy, and if it doesn't work, you can... Jenny Hammond was a registered nurse for 12 years and is a former executive director of California Nurses for Ethical Standards. Her desire to become a nurse began 30 years ago when her life almost ended. Jenny had a history of small epileptic seizures and in 1985 she contracted Giardia and was treated with Flagyl. This medication is contraindicated for patients with central nervous system disorders. The first dose caused a grand mal seizure. Jenny's husband was unable to wake her the next morning and she was later declared brain dead. Were you aware he was trying to wake yes, you? Yes, but I was unable to respond. And he called 911. They took me to the hospital and they said, we can't get the seizure to stop. And they were pumping me full of the drugs that they give, which are neurosuppressants, meaning they lower or suppress brainwave activity. Finally, um, I coded. My heart stopped, my breathing stopped. The next time I was aware of anything, I was in the ICU. I was un unable to move, to speak, to open my eyes. I was um, what they call locked in. But I was fully conscious and aware of what was going on around me. There was one nurse I remember very well. She would speak to me every time she was in the room and let me know what she was doing, why she was there. She called me by name. There was another nurse, I came to recognize her footsteps and um, the little sounds that she would make, but she never spoke to me until one day I heard her voice. Would somebody come in here and help me move this thing? Seriously? Seriously, she called me this thing. I was a piece of meat, I was a burden. Time was hard to judge. I had awake times and asleep times. And when I was awake, I understood everything that was going on. But I wasn't always awake. I did have sleep time. And one of the awake times, I heard multiple footsteps coming into the room. And one male voice saying, ah, this one's a sad case. Young woman, two small children at home. Her husband is being completely unreasonable. If he would just sign the forms, so many people could benefit from her organs. You can't have my organs. I need my organs. <laughs> there was another voice spoke up and said, Doctor, is it appropriate to talk like this in front of the patient? He said, hello, she's brain dead. She can't hear anything. She doesn't understand anything. There's nothing there. She only has about a 1% chance of coming out of this coma. And if she does, she'll be a vegetable. So your determination was pretty strong at that point, I'm pretty guessing? Pretty strong at that point. It was less than a week later I came out of the coma. Isn't that amazing? And the, um, the, the thing is this isn't an isolated case, <coughs> tragically. Uh, we see this played out time and time and time again. <coughs> Once in a while, a patient will escape to tell of the horrors that goes on. But just imagine all of those that don't, that uh, succumb to this kind of treatment and are killed. Um, in this special, we also had um, other experts who talked about what they saw during their professional life. Ter Teresa Damph um, uh, was a, a nurse in the area of the hospital where this, you know, intensive care where the sickest, sickest of the sick were. And to listen to her comments, I think is enlightening and that it'll show you just how the uh, medical community has evolved. That evening, another doctor who was actually uh, one of um, Jasmine's um, personal doctors, he came into the room after a, a whole day of surgery and he basically said, um, you know, Jasmine signed a donor card. 
And her wishes were that when she died, that she would donate her organs. And I looked at him and I said, yes, but doctor, when she signed that donor card, was it informed consent? When she signed the donor card, was her definition of death and organ donation the same as yours? Well, her family understood organ donation, giving your organs after death would be that she's removed from the ventilator, she stops breathing, her heart stops, they say their goodbyes, and then you are allowed to take her and take her organs. And the doctor looked at me and he said, well, he goes, then her organs would be useless. Nobody does that. And I said, you know that, and I know that. But I said, she didn't know that when she signed that card. See, the reality, and if you're an organ donor, uh, this won't please you, but th the only way to donate your organs into, and, and have them given to another person or patient is if your heart is beating. Uh, if, that, if there is respiration in your body and those organs are getting oxygenated blood. If your heart stops after a couple minutes, those organs are no good to anybody. This reality caused us to put on our website at lifeissues.org um, information for every state if you wish to get off the, the organ donation uh, system. Now, we're not... We're not preaching against organ donation or tissue donation. We just want you to be informed. And my son, um, who drives, rides a Harley, was an organ donor. And I said, if you're in critical condition, they can take away our rights. We can't protect you, and they'll slice and dice you up. If they decide to, they'll declare you brain dead. And based upon your wishes to donate your organs, that would that would be uh, above and beyond our authority to stop them. So lifeissues.org, you need to do it in a very formal way. That's why we researched all of the 50 states. Uh, you will look uh, at your state and find a, um, a link there and information where you can have that done. Uh, my son uh, decided he didn't want to be an organ donor. Okay, I mentioned about the money, and it's really, you know, abortion is about the money. If you took the financial gain from Planned Parenthood out of the abortion equation, uh, they'd find something else to spend their time and energy and resources on. And that's the case here. Um, Dick Teresi um, authored a book that you may be familiar with. It's called The Undead, and he once supported brain death. And uh, he detailed in his book the problems with that. Uh, the transplant industry generates $20 billion, B as in billion, a year. That's a lot of money. And there's over $1 billion on Im Im immunosuppressive drugs that's so the organs and tissue are not um, rejected by your body. That's an industry unto itself. Uh, transplant surgeons are paid very well, which probably isn't a big surprise to you. And uh, hospitals, though, receive a finder's fee. And that's exactly what you um, might want to call it. Otherwise, uh, flowery words for uh, explaining, you know, pay to provide organs. Uh, and they s explain those as administrative costs. And then there's billing, uh, insurance company for services. So, you know, a heart could, if a heart was transplanted in a hospital, that could generate a million dollars in fees and services for that hospital. And if you have a body for, say, a young 20-something uh, person who was declared brain dead and you're able to harvest several organs and you're able to do all that locally in that hospital, imagine the income that would be generated for that facility we have to realize about the practicality that's driving this. As, as much as we don't want to think that, that money could motivate this, we've seen it in the abortion industry. 
We've seen uh, money motivate uh, a, a downgrading of health care. Um, it's, just, it's just a sad reality. Okay, here's another video I wanna, want to uh, show you. Angela Clementi, uh, she provided, uh, she does provide uh, testimony and resources on information, and she also comes at this from a personal point of view. What do you think is the incentive of the hospital to declare somebody brain dead so that they can harvest their organs? Financial, financial. I have to have a transplant. I'm waiting for a transplant, I'm ill. I have a, a, a liver issue that if I don't have one, I'll die. Just my surgery alone, they've, I've already been quoted a half a million dollars just for the liver. So can you imagine if they get a patient's body that gives the corneas, gives a, you know, a heart, gives a, a lung, and they don't give the patients time enough it's generally around three days. Yeah, and, and Teresa, that's the nurse, uh, when she went into the intensive care area, she says, I suppose you get a lot of gifts at Christmas from, from patient, uh, families of patients that have grown fond of you providing care, and they looked at her like she was from another planet. She says, our patients are never here that long for us to have a relationship with the family. So um, to get more of these stories, you could go to Facing Life Head On or FacingLife.tv. Um, FacingLife.tv, we have uh, both of these episodes streamed in their entirety if you want to catch that whole story. Um, I wanted to, to share just an excerpt of uh, Bobby Schindler's report to the board for Terry's network. He, he always shares his, the, the cases that come, are called in or, or ways in which they are involved in emergency situations to protect patients or otherwise. And um, late this year, he said, four recent brain dead, so-called brain dead cases came in where every hospital decided to end their lives within one week of the brain injury onset. See, and, and this, is, this defies any medical knowledge or tradition or practice. It takes a while for the brain to recover from major injury or loss of oxygen. To rewire, the younger the patient, the better the outcome is or the better the chances. But here in this one little snapshot, we saw every hospital in four cases decided to end their lives within a week of the onset of the injury to the brain. So you all need to make sure that you have somebody there that will guard, safeguard your life. And um, the best thing to do is get uh, a power of attorney or a document that you can find on our website at lifeissues.org from a pro-life perspective, from a perspective of respect for human life and uh, we will provide a custom document for you for your state that complies with state laws. So if you want to, uh, if you're interested in that and interested in circulating it, we can either email that to you or hard copy mail it to you, whatever, whatever works for you. We want to help protect you. Um, I, I've got a few things. How, how much time do we have left? Five, ooh, we'll go quickly here. Um, I want you to know that Governor Gavin Newsom of California w was recently quoted as saying, we want to be a no-kill state. Now, now, if you think he's found Jesus and protects life, I have a big disappointment. He's talking about cats and dogs, and he, he wants legislation to protect and make every uh, kennel a no-kill state. Uh, kennel throughout the state. Now, this, this flies in the face of abortion legal throughout pregnancy for any reason. It flies in the face of the fact that they force or mandate every college, public college and university to provide free of charge chemical abortion on every campus. It, it defies the fact that assisted suicide is legal 
and it's legal to encourage the terminally ill to use it. Not just make it available, but it's legal to encourage them. It allows for dying patients who are involuntarily committed to a psychiatric hospital uh, to opt for uh, <coughs> suicide, assisted suicide, uh, even with that mental illness. Canada, our friends to the north, I'll tell you what, they just, they outright legalized euthanasia and the so-called safeguards are quickly falling. Um, they are allowing those who opt for euthanasia to donate their organs. Now this is a Pandora's box within a Pandora's box, uh, but when they started this, the patient had to initiate the discussion so there wouldn't be coercion. Now the transplant teams can contact them and the, the danger or risk of coercion uh, and promotion of euthanasia. Well, just think, you can end your suffering and you can do all this good by giving so many people your organs and tissue. I, you can just hear those conversations over and over again. And that is something uh, very, very, very dangerous. Um, um, there was a young girl in California who they declared brain dead and her mother refused to, uh, to um, accept that. They had to, to basically flee to New Jersey where she could be protected. And I was at her bedside and I saw her respond. Uh, she was sleeping when we got into to her room and started talking. She was lightly snoring. I, we heard it with our own ears. And as we talked at her bedside, we woke her up and the snoring stopped. We saw her try to shift to get more comfortable. Uh, we saw her move upon command. But a lot of the drugs they give patients diminishes their ability to respond. And that coupled with the brain injury, it takes a while for them <coughs> to respond. So if you put a patient under the microscope of saying, do this or we pull the plug, you're setting that patient up for a uh, certain death. Now, there's no, in, in uh, Canada, you don't have to um, tell a, pac a, a patient that the heart that they're getting is from a patient that opted for suicide and euthanasia. So if, if, they, if you oppose that and don't want to support that or be part of it, they're not required to tell you that. A superior court justice struck down the requirement that death can't, must be imminent Two, death must be reasonably foreseeable. Now, yeah, as, as, as I look out over this audience, and a, a lot of you have the same gray hair I do, you know, I'd say chances are you're more imminent than the average person out there. So, but a, as the woman stated here and took away my line, we're all we're all going to be subject to that. So, um, and it's expected that they will expand um, to non-terminal euthanasia also. And we expect that they will expand to death by organ donation for those who want to opt for euthanasia. Right now they say you can't do any better donating organs than within that couple minutes time frame of administering euthanasia and then cutting out the organs. So what they want to do, their next step will be, and they have expressed a desire to do so, is just put the patient under like a normal surgery and then take out the organs and uh, that's how the patient dies, by euthanasia. So I, I'm so sorry to be so gloom and doom, <laughs> but this is reality and we have to be there to warn others. We have to be there to educate others. Uh, that's why we're dedicated to pro-life education at the Institute, because education empowers. Education saves lives. So I'm very, very happy to see you all here, and thank you very much for coming. All righty. Um, we've got a couple of minutes for questions. So a lot of hands going up over here. I've, I saw these two go up very first. Ma'am? If I could get a oh. bottle of water, that would be great. <laughs> uh, when we lived in the state of Oklahoma, when you got a driver's license, they asked you and encouraged you to sign on as a donor, an organ donor. 
So it was printed on your driver's license. Yeah, that's true. We just, my wife and I just moved to Florida, and we got that question, of course. And every time we renewed our license in Ohio, they asked us that question. So they, they made it that. Yeah, all the more reason to be educated and share that information with others. Uh, good morning. My name is Gary. And in the process of researching your, your videos, have you ever encountered the term slow code? I wonder if that's um, the same as terminal. Um, no, that would be different uh, uh, than terminal sedation. Is that just a slow response to the emergency? That, so that, that the patient is dies? exactly that. Yeah. I have not heard that term, um, but I have, we have had hospital personnel and patients, families talk about that same process. We just, they didn't coin it that way. Can we talk after? Sure, absolutely. This is a mutual question. So it dovetails on the question of um, the person. Um, yeah, Ron, you go ahead. In South Carolina, we can do the same as you. We can put on, you know, when driver's license, we can say yes. If we renew it and say no, does that revoke the previous decision? No. Ah, no. okay. Um, you may feel better about it. Yeah. But they've, they've got you on record electronically. But how, how do, what you do is say you revoke it. You, you go to our website, lifeissues.org. Yeah. What's your North Carolina? South Carolina. South Carolina. Click on that state, and then um, you'd, you'd want to go to the nearest one to where you are. Um, just logistically, that, that helps uh, enhance the, the idea that it'll be permanent. Uh, and then you want to reissue, have your, your driver's license reissued, because if it's still on there yeah. and you've revoked it, they're going to go by what's on he, your Even if it's not put on when I renew and say, no, I don't want to do it this time, it's you, still on record somewhere. Yes, you, you, have to, you have to actively revoke it. Virginia mm has -hmm. it on there. Okay, we're going to take one. Uh, hi. Oh, ooh, here oh, we go. There you are. Okay. Um, hi. I, um, I have a mother-in-law who lives with us, and she is, oh, she's been chronically ill for many, many years. And, you know, learning these things it's like I I worry about her and you know what doctors will decide to do with her you know, as she ages where can I go to kind of learn how I protect her well I would encourage you to go to the Terry Schiavo Life and Hope Network uh, they have resources and information if there is an, an uh, urgent need there is a hotline that you can call and um, they can uh, provide doctors or attorneys for you and on a very short notice. Uh, they have a pretty good network built up, so. Okay. Um, hi, I'm wondering about the other side of the equation. If a person's in a position where they're told they could benefit from a transplant, um, is there a way to protect yourself from getting these kind of transplants or should a person just draw the line and say, I would not accept a transplant? Well, sadly, if, if you need an organ, um, the only way for you to get a viable organ is for it to be taken from another person with a beating heart. If you cannot accept that, then you will have to make the tough decision of, of asking not to receive those. Now, there are a lot of organs or there's a lot of tissue and whatnot in your body, like your corneas, uh, tendons, various things that could be harvested after you die legitimately. What I've told my wife to do is once... Uh, I'm dead, I'm assuming I'll go before her, um, <laughs> is that um, then she, if she wants, she can, uh, we've opted for cremation, so they can carve away as far as I'm concerned after I'm dead. Yeah, yeah. Whoever has Hi, the mic. Um, I know since Canada legalized euthanasia and there's other countries that have legal euthanasia, um, is it legal for the transplant teams to pay the surviving family members for the organs? Well, no, it's not. And unfortunately, the, the family members and the patient are the ones that don't get any remuneration. Pretty much everybody else does. Uh, the, uh, the team that comes in there. And let me tell you, when uh, this little girl was declared brain dead in California, they aggressively sought out the family to ask uh, for the organs. 
They interrupted her prayer for her daughter in the chapel. They, uh, they uh, picked on or, or isolated a, a niece of the, the mother and got to her separately. One even came in in street clothes with a big bouquet of flowers for the mother, just saying that they wanted to express uh, support for her. And then in reality, it was a member of the team, a transplant team who just wanted to get to her to try to, to get that, those organs. Thank she you. lived for five years, by the way, after all this being brain dead. Last question. Oh, thank, you. thank you so much. I'm a nurse and I deal on the front lines with this. And so a couple of things I just wanted to say. Please get do organ, organ donation off of your driver's license. There are protocols in place at many hospitals that if you arrive as a trauma and they think you can get your organs, they will not treat you and allow you to become brain dead so that they can get your organs. Um, I am not legally allowed to talk to families about organ donation. Only the harvesters of organs are allowed to talk to them. Yeah. And they also are now doing living donation. So if you want to be an organ donor, but your heart won't stop, you're not brain dead, your heart hasn't stopped, they will take you into the, say goodbye, take you into the operating room, give you masses, doses of meds to make your heart stop, and then immediately cut you open and harvest your organs. So we are already doing, and that's well known. Um, so yeah, but please get that off your license. I advise everybody I know because you will not get treated if you arrive and they think they can get your organs. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brad. That was awesome.